Welcome to Medically Speaking, a podcast of Self Regional Healthcare. This is our first podcast, and I'm super excited to have Dr. Jamel Felder with us today. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on Dr. Felder. Um, Dr. Felder is a native of Florence, South Carolina. She currently lives here in Greenwood um, with her husband and family, and uh, she is uh, one of our pediatricians at Self Regional Healthcare. Um, she's married to Dr. Alan Pacinger, a personal friend of mine, and uh, a farmer over in Newberry County as well. Uh, good guy. And uh, Dr. Felder earned her Bachelor of Science degree from Duke University and uh, her medical degree from Medical University of South Carolina down in Charleston and completed pediatric residency at East Carolina Brody School of Medicine. She's board certified in both pediatrics and obesity uh, medicine, and we'll be talking about those, uh, those topics today. Uh, she also has a certificate in diversity and inclusion training and has been working at Self Regional since 2005. So uh, welcome, Jamel. So glad to have you here today. Thank you, Dr. Logan, for uh, inviting me. And I'm very excited to be on this first podcast. Great, great. And again, I'll introduce myself real quick, Matt Logan. Um, I'm uh, the CEO here at Self Regional. I've been with Self Regional for 18 years in a variety of roles, some clinical, some administrative, and uh, excited to start this podcast series. And Jamel, super glad that you can be our first guest today. So um, with that said, I thought we would just maybe kick off with, uh, with a little, uh, some questions. So we're going to be talking today about uh, pediatrics, some and some about obesity and um, uh, some about uh, how uh, it seems like some uh, races may be more affected uh, by the obesity pandemic or epidemic than yes. others. Um, so I really appreciate your insights on that. So maybe we'll start with um, what are some just basic statistics on children with obesity? Okay, so um, the South, I'll talk about the highest rates of obesity among children from 2 to 19 years old in the United States. So um, the highest rates um, you may not know, but are in African-American girls at 29.1% and Hispanic boys at 28.1%. So, and that's been... Um, stable, um, that mm -hmm. those uh, minority groups are the highest in obesity rates. Um, and then in South Carolina, overall, for all children, we're ranked ninth for obesity rates in children 10 to 17, um, and that rate is 20%. Mm. Okay, so yeah, definitely some significant impact on, uh, on our communities, for sure. Um, so um, with that said, uh, what would you say are the most impacted um, uh, groups uh, with obesity um, overall, and we're looking at, like, say, the state of South Carolina. Okay. Well, I, I do have some stats on that. So the adult obesity rates um, in the country is highest in African Americans um, at 49.6%. So, you know, half of um, black adults um, struggle with obesity. Um, and then that uh, cohort of black adults, um, the most um, uh, highest group is black females at 56%. Um, and then in South Carolina, that also par pars out with the highest rate being in uh, black adults at 45%, um, followed by Hispanics uh, uh, in the country at 44%, and then whites at 42%. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, what are some treatment options, for example, like say for uh, or obesity or some lifestyle modifications that could be made by people um, who, who struggle with obesity? Um, so when I went to get my uh, board certification in obesity medicine, I, I did a course at Harvard um, called a Blackburn Burn course. And um, basically, we haven't been taught this, how to treat obesity. We weren't even really taught about obesity when I went to medical school. Um, and, you know, now changing the narrative about obesity, that it's a chronic disease, just like cancer, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, is where those of us who are board certified are tasked to now do. Basically, you know, we, we taught calories in, calories out, eat less, move more. Um, and that just doesn't work. I was, you have to have a, a behavior modification piece and you have to kind of sit with families and figure out the social determinants of health that may be affecting um, their uh, behaviors that are causing them to be obese, as well as, um, you know, the lack of understanding on how they can make those changes. So some treatment op options are stratified, of course, but you start with lifestyle modifications. Um, you know, helping people eat better, you know, understand more about 
their nutrition um, and exercising certainly is a, a, a vast piece of that. Um, but the main uh, stay of treatment should be how we treat all our other um, chronic illnesses, and that's with medication and possibly with interventions such as bariatric surgery, if, if need be. Um, but I think the main thing is to have um, honest and open conversations with patients about um, their status on whether they're overweight um, or if they're obese. Um, and sometimes doctors have a, um, a hard time saying those words because people can take offense to it. And so um, you have to be careful how you bring those conversations up. So, Jamel, what would you say uh, from your perspective, what is health equity and how does obesity affect health equity? Um, so I'm going to give you the healthy people, people, uh, healthy people, 2020 definition. Health equity is um, it requires valuing everyone equally with focused ongoing societal efforts to address avoidable inequalities and justices to eliminate health disparities. And basically why I wanted to read the definition is because it's kind of esoteric. But now I can kind of break down what that means. And so when I do talks and, you know, I've done uh, several of these lectures, you know, we talk about equality versus mm -hmm. equity. So if you can imagine someone riding a bicycle, which is the picture I always show, and everybody has the same access to the same bicycle, then that's equality. And so sometimes we get into a mindset of, well, it's available. It's there. Um, you have a bike, you have a, a way to, you know, ride around if you choose to. Mm -hmm. um, equity, on the other hand, is tailoring that bike to everyone for their specific needs. So if you're a child, it's a kid size bike. If you are disabled, um, it's a bike where, you know, you can sit in a maybe a three wheeled bicycle where you could have your hands on some uh, uh the bicycle handles, but you also are able to be in a seated position. Um, if you're a female, maybe the bike set is lower than if you're a taller male. So um, so I like to always give that graphic because then that can give you a picture of the difference between um, equality and equity. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as how that plays into obesity, where well, I always tell people there's a reason why um, the, the onus of that statistic uh, lands in um, black Americans. So for, you know, you can't just say it's because they're black, which is one of the reasons why we need to get away from identifying, you know, me and you have talked about this mm -hmm. before, about why we in medical school um, have to say in our histories, you know, a 60 year old black male. But what we have to do is peel that back and, and figure out what is happening in those communities, why they have the higher rates of obesity. It may be, um, I will share some um, stats for social determinants of health. So for in African Americans, they are, um, have a higher in, uninsured rate. Um, they're less likely to have a PCP. Um, they're more likely to live in a multi-generational home. They're more likely to have, um, we have higher unemployment rates and higher poverty levels and higher food insecurity. So when you take all of those pieces together, um, there are things that are happening socially, economically, that are um, in interfering with um, able to have health equity around certain diseases. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, it sometimes may not be uh, something physiologically different between, say, uh, one race or another, but more uh, some of the social factors that people maybe grow up in that affects their, uh, I guess, their decisions or how they, they end up um, along the health path, uh, either healthy or not healthy path. Is that, would you say that's accurate? That is very accurate. And in fact, 20% uh, of an individual's health is attributed to clinical medicine. So what we do in our clinics, mm -hmm. hospital settings, but 40% is attributed to social or economic factors, 30% health behaviors that we may pick up to cope with said uh, social or economic factors. I'll get to that mm -hmm. in a minute. And then 10% is physical environment. So like if you live in a, um, you know, a rundown place with, you know, lead in your water. So that's the physical environment. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certain uh, zip codes in certain cities where that's where you live. And so um, so that's only 10%. But mm -hmm. if you can imagine that you live in those kind of areas where you get lead coming out of your water, um, and then 
that obviously should probably is a high poverty level. And then you, as a coping mechanism, decide to overeat or drink or smoke or, or what have you to cope with that. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that sometimes we develop health behaviors that are not conducive to overall good health in the long run because of sometimes as coping mechanisms. Mm-hmm. Um, and as humans, we all, you know, some sometimes we do that. And then um, the other social and economic factors, poverty, unemployment, um, and cyclical poverty, uh, generational poverty, meaning that's all you've known from my grandmother was, you know, we lived in poverty, then my parents. And, and so so looking at some of those structures and how we can intervene in those aspects um, are ways that we need to move forward in medicine. Um, now, we're not social workers, and I know people want to say that that's not our job as medical professionals. Um, but I beg to differ. And if you're going to um, help a family or a child or an adult tackle some of these complex uh, chronic health illnesses, you're going to have to get at the root of the causes of why it's occurring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you. I think the uh, getting to the root cause is, is really key in addressing that root cause of why are we in this situation. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, as I think about that, Sue, from from your perspective and and your knowledge and training, and us as a, a community here in Greenwood, South Carolina, and the surrounding communities that we serve, like what can we do as healthcare professionals, or and also as a community, um, you know, whether it be from the city or county governments or whatnot, what should we be doing? What can we do to make the biggest impact? On, uh, on health equity and specifically around obesity. Like if you could just name a couple things in your mind that we could, we maybe could help focus on to, to really move the needle. So I think, um, folk, I love that question. I think focusing, cause you don't want to have the, all the bad stuff and no solutions. So I'm definitely solution driven. So one of the things that I think is the main thing is education. Mm-hmm. So I don't think there's enough discussion about obesity. Um, there's not enough discussion about how in a um, healthcare setting, how do we make changes around obesity? Mm-hmm. So I've had several people come to me and say, well, I go to my doctor and he says, lose weight and I'll see you in three months. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you, you, and we also need more time to, you know, to kind of deal with these com- complex complex issues, but that's not really what we're talking about, but giving people tools. So not just saying lose weight. Well, how do you lose weight? Mm -hmm. You know, sitting with somebody and trying to figure out what it is they're eating, how much they're eating. Um, You know, maybe you need to focus on eating a Mediterranean diet, more Mm -hmm. different than what we typically eat as um, black people. Um, But there are people that are switching their eating habits because it's healthier. It's better for your body. But also, you know, explaining that there are treatment options. So um, not just saying lose weight and I'll see you in three months. Try to partner with that person and try to figure out what is the biggest um, roadblock into making those changes. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, is there something that's hindering them they don't understand um, or they feel like they've been dismissed and so they feel ashamed and they don't come back in the three months because... Mm -hmm. They go home, they don't have any roadmap on what to do, they steadily are gaining weight, and then they don't want to come back to hear that again. Well, mm-hmm. you didn't lose you didn't lose weight this time. Keep at it and you know, the same cycle. So I think we have to transform the way we um, take care of people um, struggling with obesity. I think we have to be uh, eliminate the stigma around it. Um, there's no stigma around cancer or high blood pressure. It's a chronic disease. Um, now, there are multifactorial reasons of why someone may be um, struggling with obesity, but the compassion, the empathy, all the tools that we use to take care of those type of patients as well, we need to transfer that over to obesity. So that was mainly education mm-hmm. we, and on both sides, healthcare professionals, patients, the community. Now, as far as other things communities can do, you know, we could... Um, I think there was supposed to be a plan where we were supposed to have a walkable bike ped plan. Um, I'm not sure where we are in that, but, you know, have more safe walkable areas, places where um, people feel safe to come and play exercise. Um, You know, you have to have, uh, I remember one time one of the parks had a metal slide so the kids couldn't get on that in the middle of summer because it's too hot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just thinking through things like that, um, safe 
clean, you know, kept up parks that um, people can move in and um, also um, just giving people other options aside from lifestyle modifications because there are other options for treatment other mm-hmm. than those things. Mm-hmm. You know, I, this just kind of got me thinking a little bit when we were talking about community things the um, and education specifically. Um, so are there some statistics that show that the le- as the level of education increases, um, there is also a, uh, an improvement in health equity. Like for example, um, if, um, I don't know, if you attain a high school degree versus if you attain a couple years of college versus if you attain a bachelor's degree, I know, uh, around us, a lot of, uh, like even like mortality, there's like almost a direct correlation between level of education and length of life. Mm -hmm. Is there, are there similar uh, statistics um, or data around obesity um, and other health equity uh, with health literacy, things like that, with a correlation with education and uh, obesity Um, and health equity specifically? Those um, studies have been done, but still across uh, socioeconomic status um, and education, um, African American females still have the highest rate um, of obesity, mm-hmm. um, and so there's something outside of that that's also um, causing that statistic mm-hmm. to hold steady among all um, education levels um, and social economic status. And mm-hmm. now that you say that. Um, I, I did want to just say a, a small thing about um, maternal mortality after having infants um, and infant mortality. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's still, for some reason, um, blacks are the highest in those categories. Mm-hmm. So black mothers um, that are postpartum, no matter what their social economic status or education, um, are at a higher risk of um, having um a demise after a uh, delivery, mm-hmm. no matter what um, social economic status they are in. Um, and so, you know, there are other uh, issues here. So, so, so some of those, I'm so glad you're getting to those. So some of those are um, bias in treatment and um, in healthcare and, and the fact that for instance, like for um, maternal um, mortality after uh, having an infant. Um, sometimes infant uh, mothers or African American mothers are told to go home, or this is just normal. And by the time they come back, um, it's too late. Um, mm. And that happens um, unfortunately too frequently. So um, there are other um, factors that, um, and I know that's not necessarily the question you asked me, but but I think it's important to recognize that um, sometimes. Um, unfortunately, when we're um, uh, coming to the healthcare arena, sometimes we aren't treated the same. Just this week, um, I was telling one of my um, friends, there was uh, the American Academy of Pediatric put out uh, a newsletter every, every day, every other day. And there were three headlines on one particular newsletter um, this week. One was about lead levels and how they affect IQ um, in children, um, in black children. The other one was um, the still increased preterm birth rate um, that is higher in our developed country than most undeveloped countries or the other developed countries in the world. We're still high with our preterm birth rates. Um, and they were saying that there were still gaps in care um, based on racial and ethnic groups. Um, and so, you know, there are some other uh, deeper issues um, that also um, plague our communities more than others as mm-hmm. well. Jamel, what do you think that we should be doing at Self Regional Healthcare and really healthcare systems across the country to address these um, uh, possible inequalities in care and to ensure that we're providing that high level care for every single patient, regardless of their skin color, or their gender, or their race, or really any anything else that we could have bias around? How, how do we really tackle that? Well, that's a good question, and I'll just have to say um, thank you for your efforts of um, pushing diversity and inclusion um, 
to the forefront of self-regional health care. It's in our mission statement that we want to treat everyone the same and at, uh, offer excellent health care. And I think in order to do that, you have to um, train folks as far as looking at implicit bias. Um, not all the time, but you have to call it out and, and make sure that people aren't um, using that. And, and it's, an, it's an unconscious thing. It's not something that people are doing on purpose. It's that um, the brain is a magnificent thing and that it uh, quickly can put things in categories based on previous experience, previous um, social media or TV ads or whatever. And so you may be thinking that you're get, treating someone um, with um uh, non-biased care, but you've had all of these things that have entered your brain over the course of your whole life and your whole life experience that you're not really aware of, that you have an implicit bias towards them or that racial group or women or any other thing that you could have a bias. It could be weight bias, that you impl implicitly have a bias against someone who is in the obese category. So what you have to do is kind of recognize that. You have to do some self-reflection. But I think educating your staff, your healthcare team on that it exists and that it's not really you trying to be um, mean to somebody, you're just not aware. And so what, and we're in a fast paced environment in medicine, you know, visits are tried to be quick and fast and try to move people along. But in order to make sure that you're given that equitable care, that takes um, some time. It also takes recognizing if you are getting in that um, mindset of, oh, I'm this is a bias here. This is a blind spot that I have. So the first thing I would say to do the training so that people know that, that it exists. Um, secondly, I think, um, you know, making people aware of some of these studies that I'm talking about, um, you know, people could say, oh, yeah, yeah, there's implicit bias. But, you know, if it's a, a something in your specialty, you know, oh, really, this is, you know, this is good to know. Um, I wasn't aware that, you know, X, Y, and Z, or, you know, African-American women were the highest category for obesity, or um, black mothers um, have increased uh, e episodes of maternal demise after birth or preterm birth rates. Um, you know, so I think education, uh, you know, I, I sound like a broken record, but um, education, training, your staff, um, but also making sure that you have a, a good uh, diversity and inclusion program. Um, the work that Salento and you have done with uh, making sure that diversity and inclusion is a, a part of our strategic plan going for, forth, I think is most important as well, because um, it not only affects the health care that you give, but also um, the place that where people work. And you want people to feel included and um I had one professor tell me when I got my um, diversity inclusion training is that um, diversity is being invited to the table and inclusion is feeling comfortable in your seat mm. and at the table. So I think we have to make sure that people feel comfortable in their seat. Um, and when they do that, they can give the best care um, to the patients that are coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jamel. So, you know, as I think about exactly what you said the um, part of the things that come to mind is like the culture that we have at, at our hospital right so I kind of think so you hear the word culture a lot or I, I certainly do it's like we want the whatever culture the inclusive culture or the you know mm -hmm. the happy culture or whatever you right. know it's almost like it becomes a little cliche um, I, I heard once that uh, culture really is a combination of core values and then behaviors that support those core values. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I think about like our hospital system here in, in Greenwood and the surrounding counties, um, you know, to really get to that inclus inclusive level, I really think it kind of fits, right? So our mm -hmm. core values are quality, integrity, compassion, and respect. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we can develop behaviors consistently around those core values, we will deliver quality, high quality care mm -hmm. with integrity, compassion, respect. I think we're going to be at a good place. But um, I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so I think we are at the baby steps mm -hmm. of diversity and inclusion, um, to be honest with you. Um, so there are there are. Uh, different so diversity 1.0 2.0 3.0 there's a framework and um when you're starting something new um firstly you have to recognize there's a problem 
which we did. We created our diversity and inclusion work group and has done a lot of work since 2017. Um, but I think our we have a lot more that we could do. Um, but I think when you're starting and you're at the beginning, you just keep putting one foot in front of the other and you keep trying to um, move the culture towards where you want it to be. Mm -hmm. So um, do I think we have done some stuff? We have done lots of stuff. We have um, made great strides as far as moving our culture towards being um, more inclusive. Um, but I think we can definitely um, work on uh, getting that culture to, to um, the feeling of that culture to be, I don't think everybody feels comfortable in their seat. I guess if I'm going back to what my professor said, um, I'm not sure that everybody feels comfortable in their seat. And so I think um, that's the second step. Mm -hmm. You know, we started the process. Um, I think uh, we need to make sure that everybody is comfortable in their seat. And I, I can't say that we're there yet, but I think we can move towards it. Um, it's, a, it's a huge endeavor to try to... Um, you know, try to tackle diversity and inclusion. It almost is, um, you know, one of these cliche words, like you're saying, just like culture. Um, and sometimes people have a negative connotation around diversity and inclusion because um, if you think about um, if somebody else is included, then I'm losing something. Um, and that's the wrong way to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, everybody comes from different backgrounds and cultures and everybody has something to contribute. Um, I think you're a better institution if not everybody's saying the same thing. Um, people can say something differently and give you a different perspective that you've never even thought of before. And I think that's when you can say that your culture is inclusive. When the, the think tank and the think speak is not the same, you've included different voices from people from different backgrounds and cultures and you have everybody in on it, that's when you've kind of mm -hmm. got that's diversity 3.0 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah no, i i really personally enjoy hearing a lot of different peoples with different people's backgrounds perspectives on things because i 100 percent agree people definitely see it from a different perspective depending on kind of how they were brought up right mm -hmm. and um i think it is important to have a, a a mix of people at the table when decisions are being made so i, I definitely agree with you and i think we are on a good path i think we are uh, like you said we've started and we still have work to do yeah. um but uh, I, I know we're gonna be in good place uh going forward and, oh i know uh, we are i mean so, you know i i think you and i've talked offline oh, that yeah. it takes um a couple of years to see the sea change but i mean i'm very um confident that uh, you can and change the tide. I, I, I have very much confidence in that. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. So um, I did want to touch on one other thing just to kind of get back on the obesity topic for a second. Um, so uh, around treatment specific to obesity. Um, so you mentioned there's some medicines. Maybe we could talk for a few minutes about mm -hmm. like specifically like what medicines are, what's the role of, of medication in obesity treatment as well as uh, behavioral modification as well as potential bariatric surgery. And which patients should we be considering bariatric surgery versus more of a medical or a behavioral uh, treatment options? Okay. So, you know, piggybacking on what I just said about changing this, uh, this uh, changing the tide on treatment and obesity. So we have to um, kind of get away from just telling people to um, move more and eat less. That just clearly is not working. The obesity trends have increased over the last decade and over the pandemic have really gotten um, everybody jokes about the pandemic 15 or whatever it was for you personally. Um, but that was because it was a high stressful time and cortisol levels increase your need to want to eat. Um, so we were all in a stressful time and a lot of people self-soothe by eating. Um, and so that um, post pandemic, well, now we're moving and transitioning to endemic, but a lot of people did gain a lot of weight over the pandemic. So those obesity rates that were already high. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I put on about 15 myself, but <laughs> we were just saying, but go ahead. I go did ahead. too. So <laughs> ahead, I mean, every, yeah, so yeah, I, I'm so, also guilty of so, that. So, um, but, but I think we, so those obesity rates were high pre COVID. And then we went through this big stressful thing together um, and so a lot of the obesity, had, those rates have increased. 
Um, and so, yeah, so we have to stop telling people to back from the table or making a judgment about what they're doing or not doing um, because they are um, obese. And so when I before I went to the Harvard course, I was of that mindset, right? Because we didn't learn a lot about obesity in med school um, and we weren't taught about, and there weren't a lot of treatments. Obesity medicine is a very young field, um, but we're going to explode here shortly. I'm so excited to be boarded in that specialty. But so there are a couple of treatments that I want to talk about. First, for adults, um, and the thing is they're not really indicated for obesity. So that's one of the things that people who practice obesity Obesity medicine, we've tried to get these um, acts um, passed with legislators to make sure that people, um, insurers, payers will cover obesity treatment. So that's one thing that's lacking. We don't cover these treatments. Um, and so these uh, medicines are high cost. So there's still um, only a certain segment of the population have access to it and then can afford it. So that's one of the other issues. But there's a new medicine um Terzepatide Mongero injection. It's um, indicated for type 2 diabetes, but studies have shown that people can lose up to 25 pounds on that medicine as a side effect of them using it for diabetes. And so, so, the, so what's exciting to people who pa- practice that specialty is that the root cause is obesity. If we can get that treated, then people can get off their diabetes medicines. They can get off their hypertension medicines. Um, They could potentially not go on to have heart attacks, strokes, and the like. Mm -hmm. And so um, any medicine that can, you know, help people lose weight up to 25 pounds, um, that's pretty exciting for for Mm -hmm. obesity medicine. So that one's Mongero, very expensive. It's a weekly injectable, um, fresh on the market this year. So, um, you know, sometimes you kind of have to wait for the masses to be able to get those, but, but very exciting and that it has a combination. It, um, works on two different, um, receptors, um, that decreases food intake and slows your gastric emptying and helps with your insulin levels as well. So that's how that works. And then there is a new medicine well, it's not new, but Casemia is, um, uh, for uh, Fentermine and Topamax together. Um, that's been out for a while. It is this year been FDA approved for teenagers. So you can treat teenagers with Casemia um, down to age 12. That's huge. We don't have any medicines that are really um, specifically FDA approved for teens. Um, pediatric people have to use those drugs off label all the time. But they help the teenagers, and that's the reason why they fought very hard. A lot of people lobby in, in my group of obesity medicine specialists to get some of these drugs FDA approved for kids. Um, and so Fentramine is Adipex and Topiramate is Topamax. And so we've used that uh, for quite a number of years in combination to help teenagers, as well as adults, mm-hmm. to lose weight. Um, Fentramine, you know, people have the side effects of that one, um, and it's... It's um, in certain states you um, can't use it for long term, but um, when you help somebody with high blood pressure medicine and um, three months rolls around and their blood pressure is normal, you don't take them off. Um, and that's what we have done and kind of ham, you know, put our hands behind our backs when we're treating obesity. While we say you have to, um, you know, not supposed to use fentanyl for long terms. Topamax has its. Um, drawbacks too. Some people get fog with it, so they can't, you know, they get a um, really kind of haziness with their thinking. Um, and so some people don't like that. But, um, and again, you know, payment options, all, all those kind of things um, also hinder who has access to those things. But to have a drug that's FDA approved for teens is is wonderful. So like I said, we're in the infancy of obesity medicine, but I think as um, time goes on, we're going to see a lot of change. And then bariatric surgery, um, is indicated for anyone who has a BMI greater than 40, out the, out the bat. So if someone has a BMI greater than 40, they can be um, referred for bariatric surgery. And then greater than 35. So there are a lot of people who have a BMI greater than 35, and they have to have one comorbidity. So diabetes, high blood pressure, severe, obstructive sleep apnea, something like of that sort, um, that qualifies. So greater than 40 or greater than 35 in a comorbidity. And then for children we use percentiles to describe obesity. Um, so anybody, and 
sort of percentile for children is anybody greater than the 95th percentile is considered obese. Now, you wouldn't be considered for bariatric surgery until you're at the 120th percent of the 90th percentile. So 95% here, you got to be up here. And that is um, class uh, two obesity and childhood obesity. Is there an age where someone, I, I just, am, as we're talking, I'm, I'm just thinking like, okay, well, gosh, I wouldn't think an eight-year-old at a high obesity level who hasn't been through puberty yet should should qualify for bariatric surgery. Right. Is there an age that at which I would say twelve like it's cut off twelve yeah. as young as twelve? I would, I, I would say as young as twelve, but I don't think m- many bariatric surgeons across the country would do that. So there is a um, uh, practice guidelines, mm-hmm. is, um, but I don't have that memorized. So I think sixteen is probably when they would look at it. Okay, okay, All but right. there's a, a twenty eighteen. So it's an older guideline. It's been out for four years. Um, and so, but I don't, it's, it's not out to the masses yet. You know, sometimes we, you know, straggle behind our practice guidelines. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. All right. Well, Jamel, listen, gosh, thank you so much for, uh, for talking with me today. Is there anything else that you want to touch on today before we wrap up? No, I think that's, um, I think that's everything. I, I would say that if we can um, give some, uh, you know, like you said, have compassion around treating people with um, obesity. I think that would be what I would want to end with. Mm-hmm. Um, they're people um, just like we all are, and we all have our different struggles. Um, and, you know, a lot of people struggle with obesity, and it's getting more and more common. The, the stats aren't turning around, um, and we have to figure out a way to help people mm-hmm. and not just dismiss them and say, go lose weight. We need to do more than that. And uh, if I can get that across, then I think my goal here has been accomplished. So thank you for well, thank inviting you. me. Thank you, Dr. Felder, personal friend. Really appreciate you being here uh, today. And, um, and thank you all for joining us for this very first episode of Medically Speaking, and we hope you'll join us for future episodes. Thank you. Mm-hmm.